The Secret of Western Civilization, Introduction. This is the second in a series of eight lectures exploring the role the Bible played in creating the modern world. This lecture, The Secret of Western Civilization, How the Renaissance Discovery of the Value of Mankind Shaped the Modern World, explains why the biblical view of the value of humanity created a culture predicated on human rights, equality, decency, and the elimination of human suffering. Dr. Mangalwadi argues that this view of humanity is why the West seeks to manage nature while more traditional societies become victims of nature. This worldview explains why Western civilization became only the second civilization in human history to free itself from fatalism. Dr. Mangalwadi will explain how Western worldview led to the recognition that human beings were capable of changing history, fighting disease, eradicating poverty, and bringing freedom and dignity to their fellow human beings. While working with the rural poor in India, Dr. Mangalwadi was intrigued by the West's ability to overcome chronic poverty and corruption. How could it be that the West was so different from the grinding poverty he saw all around him in rural India? Dr. Mangalwadi began a careful inquiry into the source of the West's socio-political and economic success. His inquiry led him to the conclusion that the Bible was the key to the West's achievements, that it was the Bible that distinguished the West from the rest of the world. Dr. Mangalwadi is burdened to free the billions that live under the tyranny of enslaving ideas. In this lecture, Dr. Mangalwadi takes a hard look at the historic causes of the West's success, as well as its current decline, a decline evidenced by cynicism, deconstructionism, and cultural self-doubt. Thank you very much. I am very grateful to the McLaurin Institute for this privilege of doing this series, which, uh, as those of you who were, who were here last time know, is really a trial run for a book, a television series, as well as a um, lecture series which will follow the television program in different cities. Now these lectures are evolving. I have graduated today to using overhead. I hope by next week I can use the PowerPoint. Um, but as they are evolving, I'm also uh, taking the liberty to modify these subjects a bit. So today, I think <clears throat> I still haven't got the right topic uh, for today. But what we really want to talk about is the biblical view of man and how that is the key to understanding the Western civilization, what has happened in the Western uh, civilization, in fact, in the whole modern world during the last millennium. I come from India, and one of the questions which is very natural for an Indian to ask is that we are a deeply religious, deeply spiritual nation. We have great men and women who renounce the world, who devote their lives to spirituality, who renounce everything. So why is it that we need someone like Mother Teresa to come and pick up the dying destitutes from our cities, from our slums, from our streets? Um, so that's really the question that I will be seeking to answer. Um, a slightly different question is obviously that a thousand years ago, as we've been hearing a lot since the last 12 months, uh, Islamic civilization was way ahead of the Western civilization. But why is it today that the entire Arab world, its export is less than Finland's export, if you leave the oil out, because oil is not really a product of Islamic civilization. Now, what I want to suggest is <clears throat> that the West's discovery of man and his dignity was the key to Western civilization, as well as to the whole of the modern world, the world that was influenced by the West. The Historians divide the um, ages as classical age of the Greek or Roman world um, until the 5th century. Then the Middle Ages, uh, right up to the 14th, 15th century. And then 
the modern world, which begins with the 16th century Reformation, with its roots in the Renaissance of 14th and 15th centuries. The medieval, the Middle Ages, where the millennium begins, the medieval view of man was shaped by three um, forces, or perhaps four, if I was more careful in organizing my notes. First was the pre-Christian paganism of um, Europe, which Europe already worshipped gods and goddesses and elves and demons and spirits uh, for a long time. When it became Christian, the printing didn't exist, Bible wasn't available, most people didn't read Latin, most priests were illiterate. So it was essentially paganism which had been baptized and gradually um, many of the pagan practices continued in, in the church and uh, worship of angels, worship and a prayer to saints. These were part of the pre-Christian paganism where human beings were seen as much smaller uh, than these anything which claimed or was assumed to be spiritual. The second um, important force, the intellectual or worldview force, is what I would call Greek cosmological worldview. I should have probably split Greek and the scholastic uh, philosophy, but the philosophers or the thinkers or the scholars of the Middle Ages were called schoolmen or scholastics. The scholasticism was essentially an attempt to understand biblical revelation through the lens or the grid or the categories or intellectual framework of Greek philosophy, particularly Aristotle. So um, throughout the Middle Ages, the learning in Europe great minds were reflecting on biblical revelation through Greek eyes, and that was scholasticism. Most of them would have been Aristotelian, some Platonists, um, but both Aristotle and Plato, although they dis dis disagreed with each other, or differed from each other, were shared in common a cosmological worldview. The cosmological worldview is that cosmos is the ultimate reality. God, gods, spirits, angels, human beings, we are all parts, or we have a fixed position in the universe, which we cannot change. For example, the universe begins with a golden age, it degenerates into silver and bronze and iron age, and then is destroyed and is reborn. And nobody can change this flow of cosmos, even Supreme God cannot change the flow of cosmos because he has his fixed place uh, in cosmos. Now, this was not a biblical worldview, this was Greek worldview, but it heavily influenced the Middle Ages, and as such, the um, um, that's the main reason why I have put the... Greek and scholastic worldviews together. Now the third force which uh, had a profound influence over the medieval mind was what I would call Islamic fatalism. Art, philosophy, medicine, architecture, some of the great things did come into Europe uh, from Greece via the Arab world with some of the innovations of Arabic thinkers. But one of the uh, factors which Islam injected into the Middle Ages was also its fatalism, inshallah, God's will. Now particularly it expressed itself in astrology, which was one factor which Renaissance began to fight and was a, uh, virtually wiped off the Western civilization after the Reformation, but um, Islamic fatalism, which stifles individual and human creativity, 
because if you are poor, this is God's will, you don't fight it, you don't seek to change it. Uh, these were introduced into the West uh, through um, Islamic influence, and we'll talk a bit about it. Now, the cumulative impact of paganism, cosmological worldview, and Islamic fatalism was to think of human being as helpless creature ruled by his fate. Now, I'm using man in the generic sense because back then they were politically incorrect and uh, they used man uh, as we would say the rabbit eats carrots. By, uh, by rabbit we mean both male and female. That's how they used man, both male and female. And by he, they meant in contrast to it rather than in contrast to she. So I'm using their language in most of this lecture. Now, the, um, this low view of human being, that human being is really a small creature in this frightful, a frightening universe, you know, with all the sickness, with all the misery, with all the wars, all the tragedies. Uh, this was uh, talked about as the misery of man, or the misery of human condition. And uh, Pope Innocent III was uh, one man who summarized it, this whole medieval view of man, in his book, uh, The Misery of Man. And he had intended to write a, a counterpart, which he wanted to call The Dignity of Man, but he never did actually write it. Now, it was Petrarch who was challenged to uh, res uh, give the rejoinder or give the other side, not necessarily in opposition, but as a compliment, uh, a complementary viewpoint, that yes, there is a misery of man, but there is also a dignity of man. Now, Petrarch uh, was a deeply devout Francisc uh, Augustinian, and um, he, he is the man who, as you remember, uh, was the first human being to climb a mountain uh, just for the sake of enjoying the view. Mountaineering, or the uh, medieval man didn't have that kind of an interest in nature. And this was a very important uh, milestone. There may have been other people who actually did it, but no one wrote about it. But as Petra came down, he claimed that that very night he wrote a long letter about his ascent of uh, Mount Vento. Uh, and um, he uh, wrote that letter to a gentleman who had given him a copy of Augustine, St. Augustine's Confession. Now, Augustine was writing in the 5th, 6th century. And uh, uh, many of the uh, secular humanist uh, scholars who talk about um, Petrarch's ascent of this mountain, steeple, they don't tell you that, at least according to his claim, when he got to the top of the mountain, he pulled out of his pocket this copy of Augustine's Confession and meditated on the 10th book, or uh, 10th chapter of that book, it's called 10th book, um, in which Augustine describes his own intense spiritual journey. Now, Petrarch compared his climbing of the steep mountain with Augustine's steep uh, or this intense spiritual experience. And all along, Petrarch saw himself, he identified himself with Augustine as his intellectual and spiritual model. Now he, uh, Petrarch began discussing the dignity of man. In his view, of course, he is a part of the Middle Ages. He is the pioneer of the Italian Renaissance. But in his view, um, universe is ruled by fortune. Our human life is substantially ruled by fortune. But over fortune, overarching, is the divine providence. God is sovereign. But fortune is also at play, which is uh, bad because much of it is capricious 
and a human being doesn't really comprehend the universe. But this situation can be remedied if man draws closer to God who is over uh, fortune and uh, there is some remedy that human being can experience by becoming close to God. Now, that was very different than um, uh, praying to saints, praying to angels, praying to uh, sp appeasing spirits and deities. A man can have a direct access to God as his heavenly father. So in this con uh, conflict of God's providence and fortune affecting human beings, the conclusion for Petrarch, the important point was that somehow man is at the center of the world process. Whatever is going on in the world, a man is, uh, occupies a central position and that's what gives him uh, human dignity. Um, incidentally, Arist uh, Petrarch saw his chief intellectual enemies, the Muslim influence, not because it was Muslim, but because it was fatalistic, uh, and the uh, fusion of Greek thought, which had been fused with the Islamic fatalism, he saw that as, its, uh, as his chief enemy. But this is the worldview which is harming uh, Europe, uh, he says. Now, his uh, successor in the great movement, which is called the Renaissance, was Salutati. He uh, was a very rigorous intellectual, and um, it was really... Um, his struggle, intellectual struggle, to reconcile the providence of God with the free will of man, which sort of reestablished the Augustinian view of man in the Western civilization. And these things which we're talking about happening in the 15th century had already been written by Augustine in the 5th, 6th century, but they'd been forgotten. Some of the uh, commentators on Augustine's have commented on uh, the free will of man, which is, as we will see, the core or the crux of human dignity. But um, particularly during the 12th and the 13th century, after the Islamic impact uh, on Western consciousness, the idea of the free will of man had virtually disappeared from uh, Christian writing. But uh, Salutati was the key figure who wrestles with the issues of the providence of God and the freedom of man and seeks to reconcile the predestination and salvation and uh, the uh, conflicts which have the uh, uh, contradictory viewpoints which continue to uh, be problems for much of the uh, Western philosophy. The third key character was Lorenzo Walla, who is famous because he was the one who did a careful uh, philological study of the donation of Constantine and demonstrated that uh, the um, popes were not just um, corrupt and uh, fallible, but in fact deliberately deceptive. The church had invented or forged this document uh, which uh, the Emperor Constantine is supposed to have written and given the um, authority to the church which was the authority that was being used to, uh, the, for example, um, burn heretics at stake that we talked about in the last lecture. The, now all three of these men, Petrarch, and Salutati and Vala were deeply religious men. They did criticize the church, but that criticism was not a criticism of those who hate religion or hate God or hate church, but those who were so pious that they wanted things to be reformed. So criticism can come from uh, those who reject the church, but also from those who want to see the church reformed. And most of the Renaissance thinkers and leaders were in fact um, deeply religious men, 
and scholars would say that although all of these men are living before the Reformation, they were for all practical purposes, you know, particularly Vala, uh, very evangelical, dependent on faith and grace rather than on their own works and their own piety for their salvation. Now, all three of these men talked about um, the dignity of human being as well as the misery of human being, but none of them actually wrote a book on the subject. The man who wrote the book, um, which has been translated as the oration on the dignity of man, was Pico de la Mirandola. So very often when you talk about humanism, uh, he's the one uh, you quote, or his uh, writings you uh, read, because he was a very forceful writer. They were not very careful, they were careful scholars, but they were not careful in their writing. They, their training was in Roman rhetoric, and they would, uh, exaggeration was one of their um, important um, um, trait in in uh, taking their subject to extremes, particularly in Pico. Now, one very important book uh, in this whole discussion is uh, Pico's commentary on the first chapter of Genesis, which is a study of uh, exegesis of, of Genesis 126, where God says, let us make man in our image, so he made him in his image, male and female, he blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it, establish your dominion over this earth. Now, this is important because during the 20th century and part of the 19th century, the secular humanists kept arguing that the Renaissance discovery of human dignity came from their reading of classical texts, Greek or Roman texts. Now, not, uh, none of these um, figures that I've talked about actually read Greek. When they did read Plato and Aristotle, they read them in Latin translation, which had come via the Arab world. Uh, Greek was not known in Europe until the fall of Constantine and when uh, Islam took over uh, Constantinople and many of the monk, monks fled. They brought their Greek knowledge and the Greek manuscripts. And then by the time of Erasmus and all, you have a Greek being studied in Europe. Otherwise, in Western Europe, Greek was not really studied. They were reading in Latin. So th they were reading Roman writers, and uh, particularly their um, heroes were Cicero and Virgil, the poets. Now, they used these uh, Roman and Greek writers to garnish and illustrate what they were saying about the dignity of human being. But they didn't derive their view of human being from Greek and Roman thoughts. Their view of human being, what a human being is, came from the Bible. This is very important because in the classical world, there was a doctrine of hybris, for example. You are great, human beings are great, but gods are greater, and the supreme God is the greatest. If you try and become, go beyond your own position, you are guilty of committing hybris or hubris, and then gods will take revenge and uh, persecute you, torture you, kill you, uh, harass you, unless you appease them and you find your own, uh, you stay in your own place. So that was very much a part of the uh, Greek, uh, Greek or Roman uh, uh, idea, the, the doctrine of hybris. But it was this that the humanists, and at this point they are Christian humanists, humanism began as a Christian phenomenon, they were rebelling against this, that no, Man, in fact, is like God, created in the image of God, and should become more and more like God in his intellect, in his will, in his understanding, and in his authority and rule. Um, and this, this is the part 
of what um, the, this discovery of uh, who a human being is, what a human being is, was all about. They rooted their view of human being, first of all, in the biblical doctrine of creation. God is the creator. He has created man different than the rest of the creation. He's made him, made human being in his image as creative with a free will. This, this idea in the Bible, if we go back to the Bible for a few minutes, the Hebrew idea of human being and man's place in the universe, man's relationship with God and nature was forged in their experience of Exodus. It, it was a historical experience, but it had profound philosophical consequences. Hebrews were slaves in Egypt. Moses tried to liberate them, found that he was powerless, fled, went into the wilderness, became a shepherd. After he'd been there in the wilderness for 40 years, he had an encounter, an experience uh, of God in the burning bush. The bush was burning, but was not consumed. He was intrigued. He went to see, met with God. God convinced him that I'm the Almighty God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I have chosen you. I'm sending you to go and liberate these slaves from their slavery. Now imagine Moses going to, after he's convinced that yes, God has really met with him, he goes back to Egypt, meets with these Hebrews, and he, he meets with the elders before he goes to Pharaoh with them, and he tries to tell them that, look, I've met with God, and he says that he is going to deliver us from this slavery and take us into a land flowing with milk and honey. Now that's a statement which is incomprehensible to the ancient mind. So I imagine the, a conversation between them. The elders say to Moses that, what are you saying? It doesn't make sense. We've always heard that the universe begins with golden age, degenerates through silver, bronze, and iron age, and is destroyed and is reborn. Are you saying that when the world is going from bad to worse, somehow for us and only for us a golden age will dawn? Things will become better instead of worse? Now Moses says that, look, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a metaphysician. I'm a shepherd. I just met with God. He told me that he's going to take us out of our slavery into a land flowing with milk and honey. So maybe God is not limited by history. When Moses, liberation theology may be good for you, but we are slaves. We don't have swords. Pharaoh has 900 iron chariots. You know, Moses probably said that, look, I don't know. Maybe God is not limited by military and political power. But Moses, there is a Red Sea out there. You know, we don't have boats, let alone ship. And we have so many people. How are we going to go with our belongings? And what are we going to eat in the desert? Well, 600,000 men plus women and children. Moses probably said, look, I don't know. Maybe God is not limited by natural limitations. He's not limited by history, by politics, by military, by nature. Maybe he is free and he wants you to be his image, free. Now, this was the idea of which Moses summarized when he begins uh, the a book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. He created heaven and the earth. These are creatures, creation. There was a time when there was no time, and they, these uh, entities didn't exist, but God existed. He is not a part of the cosmos. He is beyond the cosmos. He is free. 
Therefore, he can change history. He can overrule nature. Now, he wants us to be his image, free, who can change history, who can be the first cause. So, Western civilization, as a result of what um, a Renaissance humanist began to understand, became the second civilization in history which was freed from fatalism, which saw human beings as capable of making a difference in history, in becoming first cause, in changing history, uh, because what dominates us is will, as Salutati would say. Now, the second very important source of the Western understanding of what a human being is, was um, their understanding of God's incarnation in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. There was an important debate which um, had been going on for some time um, because the Christians were worshipping angels. Should we be worshipping angels? Are angels greater than us? The Septuagint had translated that verse in Psalm 8, as it was 5, that you have created him little lower than the angels. Now that's not actually what Hebrew says. If you've grown up in King James Version, you may not have noticed yet that NIV and the English Standard Version of Crossway books, they both, um, you know, both the Bibles translate, you have made him little lower than the heavenly beings, and the footnote says you have made him little lower than God. That's actually what Hebrew is saying, that you have made him little lower than God. Not lower than angels. Daniel, an apostle John, the writer of the book of Revelation, tried to worship angels and they were stopped. Hebrew says that angels are ministering spirits. So, uh, Petrarch was the one who intensified this debate. Should we be worshipping angels? Are we uh, greater than angels or lower than angels? How do human beings relate to angels? Europe was touched by angels as America is today, but they challenged that outlook. And the debate was settled in favor of man, that man is greater than, than angels, on the point of incarnation. That God became man, not an angel. He died to give salvation, eternal life, his own life, to man, not angels, so that we might become his children and rule with him throughout all eternity that we can become sons and daughters of God, not ministers, not servants, not slaves. Man is greater than angels. Now this uh, was, a, a, as we will see a, at the end, was really the turning point of the dignity of human being, that God could become man because... Um, Man was God's image. Now, the I've actually covered quite a bit of this. The, an, an important point to underline here, one difference between the Christian humanism of the Renaissance period, which continued uh, during the Reformation and following the Reformation, and the secularized humanism, which began at the end of the 18th century, flourished in the 19th century, and ended in the 20th century. One important difference was that if man is under God, which was the source of human dignity as far as the Renaissance writers were concerned, then man was accountable to God, and therefore, in as much as he had rebelled against God, God, he was a sinner. The secularized humanism 
uh, deleted this part of an understanding of human, humanism, of human being, that yes, man is great, but he is not a sinner because he is not really accountable to God. In other words, modernism, the modern age became modernistic, a modernism uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, end of the 18th century, by secularizing humanism. An important character, uh, as an illustration, uh, is the poet Shelley. He, he died very young, so his philosophy is not very well developed. But in his poetry, uh, Prometheus Unbound, Shelley twists um, the uh, legend of Prometheus. In the original legend, everyone has a great deal of piety toward, toward gods and the supreme god uh, Zeus. In Shelley, there is no piety towards gods and God. But what happens with Prometheus is that he commits hybris. He wants to grow more than what he really is. So he goes into the temple of Zeus and steals uh, originally fire, later reason. Uh, he steals reason. Zeus is mad at him and binds him for a long, long time. Prometheus is freed in the original legend when he makes his peace with Zeus. Now Shelley uh, gives a secular twist to the whole thing. The supreme god, Jupiter in Shelley, is a phantom god created by the will and the intellect and the imagination of Prometheus himself. Prometheus in Shelley symbolizes mankind, human beings. We have created the supreme God who is really phantom. Religion, as later as psychologists would say, um, is projection of human ideas and desires and needs. That's, that's what religion is. That's what God is. So we've created uh, this, uh, invented this God given all our powers to him, he begins to use, misuse, and abuse his powers over us and becomes the source of all the evil. So religion is the source of all the evil. God is the source of all the evil. Prometheus is unbound when he rebels against the tyranny of God and takes his powers back into himself. So salvation is not God saving me me surrendering myself to God, but rebelling against God and religion, taking uh, the powers that I have ascribed to this phantom God back into myself. Now, this was a secularization of um, um, the humanism, which was a product of Renaissance writers turning back to the Bible freeing biblical revelation from the influence of Greece and Islam and paganism. The important point is that although secular humanists freed human beings from God, they still had and they continue to have a, Christian, a biblical view of the greatness of human being. For example, God could not perform miracles according to the rationalists of the 19th and 20th centuries. The universe is a closed machine of cause and effect. Every effect has a cause. Therefore, miracles are impossible. God cannot act in this universe. Although God cannot act, man can act. Man still has free will. He can be the first cause. He can and he should change his destiny. So even extreme determinists like B.F. Skinner, um, who had a view of man which was totally deterministic, there is no free will beyond freedom and dignity. There is no free will. 
he would say that when we understand our human nature, we must use this understanding to change our condition, our history. If we don't, it will be wrong. So, man can in fact be a first cause, but God cannot be a first cause. He cannot intervene in nature. So, essentially, the secularized humanism continued to be biblical in this profound sense. And that's a very important uh, uh, point that the progress, the whole idea that human beings can fight disease, can eradicate poverty, can uh, eradicate totalitarianism, bring about freedom in society, that we can make a difference which emancipated the West and the colonies, so many of the colonies of the Western world, even when it was secularized, was essentially a biblical understanding of human being. And, of course, um, if I was really uh, studying the subject from serfs to citizen, I would spend more time in uh, developing the theme of what were the impacts of this view of man on literature and arts in the concept of human rights, and we'll do some of that next week. The development of medicine, development of welfare state, uh, the idea of a state existing for human being, human being being a citizen and not a property of the state. We might do some of that next week, but I think today, um, instead of pursuing the implications of that uh, view of human beings as they work themselves out in history and society, it will be good to just continue with a great deal of where we are today in development of uh, this understanding of what a human being is. Uh, to, to summarize briefly the problems which secular humanism created, I would point to three things. First was, once man was freed from God, that you, either there is no God or he is a deistic God who doesn't and cannot act in this world, we, man therefore is the measure of all things, man is the center of the universe, because there is no God, there are no angels, there are no spiritual beings, you have to take command of the situation. There was the problem of how do we understand human evil? That there is an evil side to us, it's obviously uh, clear. But if there is no God, then man is not a sinner, because man is not accountable to anyone. Therefore, the secular humanists downplayed the problem of evil, the problem of human sinfulness, uh, as caused by ignorance and illiteracy and poverty and this totalitarianism or capitalism or private property, etc., etc. Uh, these are problems which will disappear as literacy increases, education comes, and uh, classless scientific utopia is created, etc. So the problem of evil was downplayed until the evil really hit the humanists in their faces in the two world wars and rise of fascism and Nazism and communism, that it became very clear that man is fundamentally flawed. He is not as good as we thought he is and not as capable of creating utopia. When he tries to becomes, uh, become the savior, he actually becomes a monster. The second problem was, uh, which I've already mentioned, the problem of freedom. How can man be part of nature, only a part of nature, and yet transcend nature, make a difference to nature? Unless you have the idea of a free will of man, that yes, we are chemistry, but we are not only chemistry, we can transcend chemistry, we, we can make a difference uh, to nature, to history, to society. Uh, th this became an intellectual problem which they tried to put under the carpet, but obviously you cannot do it. If man is, uh, we clearly, there is something in us which transcends nature. Our nature is to become 
uh, go, go beyond nature into subjectivity, as Salutati would say. And, uh, but that was a problem which the secular humanism tried to not grapple with. That how can uh, a man be part of nature if nature is a closed machine of cause and effect? How can we be free? The, the third problem, of course, was if there is no God, an infinite personal spirit, how can human being be a spiritual being, a self or a soul, psyche? We can only be chemistry where chemicals are interacting. We cannot be, we cannot have a, a core to our being which is non-material if there is no uh, spiritual being in whose image we are made. Now, this is where um, as soon as humanism, secular humanism, really succeeded in driving God out of the intellectual map uh, or a uh, worldview, secular worldview, then humanism collapsed because if there is no divine self, there can be no finite human self. There can only be chemistry, only nature. And so postmodernism stepped into the picture because without God, the supreme self, the finite self makes no sense. David Kevin, uh, for example, who has uh, written uh, on the visions of possibilities on, in the postmodern world, he makes this point that um, the project of modernism was death of God. The modernist, the secular humanist, uh, beginning at the end of the 18th century, but throughout the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century, uh, their project was as to kill God, as Nietzsche would put it make him, leave him out of the equation, understanding of what universe and life and reality is all about. But the postmodernists take the next logical step, which is the death of self, which is totally logical. Now, the key person in this was Martin Heidegger, the German existentialist. The earlier existentialists, the French existentialists, for example, their, their view was that since there is no God, the universe has no meaning, it has no purpose. Human life has no meaning, has no purpose. You are a product of blind chance. Any purpose, any uh, meaning that the universe can have has to be given by you. You have to authenticate yourself. Authenticating yourself through your choice and giving arbitrary meaning and purpose but opening yourself to all of the experiences of life in the hope that something will make sense. Um, this was picked up by Charles Col Colson, the American poet, uh, who began writing what was being described as neo uh, non-anthropocentric poetry. Man could not be center because he was just another object, like any other object. So you cannot have poetry which celebrates man, like Alexander Pope in the 1800, writing his couplet, uh, Know then thyself, presume not God to scan, the proper study of mankind is man. You can't have that kind of a man-centered poetry because man is not the center of the universe. Now, in understanding postmodernism in American literature, Patricia Walt says that the term postmodernism was first used in the 1950s to describe Olson's poetry, the poetry that is deconstructing self. Now, that is the postmodern basis for abortionism, environmentalism, human being has no special dignity anymore. He's not more special than the owl or the fish, jellyfish, uh, which is an endangered species. The, the 
president of the people for ethical treatment of animals, Ingrid Newkirk, she put it this way, a rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy. Meaning that the human child is not inherently better and should have no special or higher privileges than a dog or a pig or a rat. This brings us to um, a discussion of the postmodernists as post-Marxists. Uh, Jean Edward Weath writes that the Marxist who ruled the Soviet Union considered individuality something to be a bourgeois concept, a manifestation of the middle class. The middle class's desire for independence, private property, and a free economy. Communism set out to liquidate all expressions of individual identity in favor of a collective communal consciousness. Now, this was Marxism. The post-Marxists take the next step. They construct the very concept of individual identity. Individual property, private property, etc., etc., were values for Marxists, but Post-Marxists, post-modernists, they are deconstructing the very idea that you exist as an individual. Now here is N.P. Rickey, who sums up the teachings of Foucault, Derrida, etc., the postmodern theorists. He says, in current theory, identity, that is individuality, subjecthood, is held to be a construct constituted by a web of forces of which consciousness is the effect rather than the point of origin. What that means is this, that normally we think of ourselves as individuals. We are self-conscious individuals who are thinking, who are learning, who are growing, who have our own opinions, who express our opinions. We, we have a center, our personality, our identity. But um, what the deconstructionists are saying is that actually your self-consciousness is not the origin of your consciousness, but it is an effect, it's a product of the impersonal cultural influences that work upon you. So as, as uh, Locke uh, said uh, 300 years ago, that man is a clean slate on which experiences sensations right. Now today you would say man is a screen on which you have all the chance. Leave him uh, working. And um, there is no core, although you have all these visuals and sounds and experiences that are happening. Individuality, in other words, is an illusion, as Foucault put it. Um, and I can never pronounce these names, Earlier, that the concept of liberty is an invention of the ruling classes. What that means uh, in different terms is the democracy is in fact more oppressive than totalitarianism. Because democracies train their citizens to police themselves. Those who think they are free are actually being more efficiently managed and controlled than those who live in the police states. Now, individuality is an illusion. What that means is that Shakespeare is not a creative genius with a unified personality who is expressing his creativity. In fact, in his works, it's cultural values which are finding expression. Now, these values include terrible values of subjugation of women and economic exploitation, etc. And because the West likes these values, it has canonized the works of Shakespeare uh, and holds it in high extreme. Quotation from we. In other words, to explain it even more, 
Deconstructionism is not simply an attempt to deconstruct literary text. Every individual is a text. You have been written by your culture, by your parents, by your environment, and you need to be deconstructed. You don't have any of your opinions because you, as an individual self, doesn't actually exist. Now, it is because of this, substantially, the mindset. Now, people don't always consciously connect all the dots in a culture. But if you run into young people or older people who are trying through mysticism, through drugs, through tantra, through yoga, to lose their individuality, to merge into an impersonal, universal consciousness. And that is because they believe that their individuality is an illusion. And this is a very real experience. Just the um, day before yesterday, I spent an hour and a half talking to a young man here who is attempting, is into yoga, is into meditation, has been mastered the Tibetan Book of the Dead, because he's trying to lose this illusion of identity, individuality. Now, I hope this uh, gives a picture. In 1996, the Copenhagen Zoo decided to have a project. The zoo keeper decided that he will exhibit a pair of Homo sapiens. His uh, intention was, is, you know, because Homo sapiens is a species that you meet every day and talk to and relate to, uh, why put them in zoo? Now, his objective was, to put it in his own words, that he wanted to force visitors to confront their origins and accept that we are all primates. The visitors saw the other hairy primates swinging on the bars, staring on the ceiling, uh, taking each other's lice, etc. But when they came to this glass cage, they saw this uh, pair of Homo sapiens, the otherwise known as Henrik Lehmann and Melin Botoft. Uh, they were reading books, watching television, working on a motorcycle, sending fax and emails and receiving them on a computer. And when they have their primitive uh, instincts, needs aroused uh, to watch a movie, or to have a candlelight dinner, or uh, go spend a night in the opera, they were free to go. Uh, it would have been illegal to deny them that freedom. Um, the visitors, they sort of asked um, Henrik if um, he would, he and his female partner would exhibit the intimate behavior in front, front of the spectators. He sniffed, that's not interesting. They refused to heed the call of nature in public, unlike all the other primates. Uh, a few weeks later, it was so, became so frustrating that the exhibit had to be closed, and they departed that monkey house. Now, that's an illustration of how far the Western civilization has traveled during the millennium. From the idea that man is a special creature, endowed with dignity and rights to the idea that he is nothing but another animal uh, conditioned by his culture, molded by his culture. Now, it may be fun <clears throat> for a radio station in New York to encourage a man and a woman to copulate in a cathedral uh, to indulge in what you would call monkey behavior. But will it be fun when your rulers begin to treat you as animals? That's what Hitler did. That's what Stalin did. Treat human beings what they are, animals. So let me come back uh, to uh, two questions. One. How do we judge a civilization? You have the whole uh, postmodern climate, the pluralist, relativist climate, 
which will condemn all attempts to judge a civilization. But their condemnation is a judgment. They cannot help but judge because we are made in the image of a person who is person and therefore makes value judgments. He makes aesthetic judgments. This tree is beautiful to look at, as we read in Genesis 2.9. He makes um, epistemological judgments. This is true and that is false. He makes moral judgments. This is good and that is evil. You should not have done that. Now, we are made in his image, so how do we judge a civilization? And I want to suggest that an important yardstick is, how did this civilization in question treat human beings? That's how you judge a civilization. Now, the Western civilization has been and still is the most humane. That is because it had a unique understanding of what a human being is. This understanding came from the man who was the main teacher of Western civilization. He believed that human beings are worth dying for. He took on, he was a rebel, he took on the religious and the intellectual establishment of his day, which would hold its inhuman legalism. On Sabbath, you cannot heal. On Sabbath, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. He said that Sabbath is made for man, not man for Sabbath. Man is valuable. He is God's child. He is worth dying for. Now, it was his incarnation and his death which really defined what a human being is for Western civilization. And that's why I come back to Mother Teresa in the end. India, with all her spirituality and religiosity, all the gurus, all the religious leaders, why did it need a Westerner to come and pick up the victims of Hindu civilizations, the dying destitutes? Now you ask her, Mother, are you telling me that this man who is dying by this roadside is greater than angels? His wife thinks he is useless. His family thinks he is useless. His caste, his state, his community, they have no use for him. His body is only good enough for the worms which are eating him and for the birds which are waiting on the trees, uh, waiting for their turn. Mother Teresa will probably say that, look, I'm not a philosopher. I don't know whether God, man is greater or angels are greater. What I know is that if this man is good enough for Jesus Christ to come to this earth and give his life for him, he's good enough for me to come to this world and serve him with my life. It is Jesus' death saw this defines the value of this man, not what his wife thinks, not what his culture thinks, not what his state or his philosophy thinks. Now, this was the force that shaped Western civilization. And that is all now going uh, out of the window. That's the challenge of this whole project in which I'm involved is to confront our generation and our world, the countries such as India, which are struggling to become modern democracies, humane civilizations where people are treated with respect and dignity and rights, to help them understand how the West became a civilization which was a humane civilization and how Afghanistan can be reformed and Iraq can be reformed and the West itself can be reformed uh, for a fresh and new awakening. Thank you very much. You have just learned how the biblical view of mankind birthed the Western understanding of human rights and fostered the expectation of human dignity. Many in the West today have turned their backs on that rich humanist heritage to the point of lowering human beings to the level of animals. Surely the philosophical foundation of human dignity and rights ought to be retained. 
Failure to do so is to risk widespread dehumanization and a great increase in human suffering. In the next lecture, Dr. Mangalwadi will speak on the Bible's role in creating modern political freedoms. This lecture will help us understand why cultures without the Bible find it so difficult to sustain decent democracies. The audio presentation you just heard was a lecture sponsored by the McLaren Institute given at the University of Minnesota. This CD is a production of the Book of the Millennium International. If you liked what you heard, we invite you to discover Dr. Mangalwadi's books and other works by visiting us on the web at www.millenniumbook.com or by calling 323-606-5249. Please encourage your friends to listen to these lectures and to discover Dr. Mangalwadi's books and other works as well. Thanks for listening.